Hey guys, so uh, we got a new paper out and we're going to be talking about uh, this paper today, which is about the, the Skyro hypothesis uh, and our new study. So this is our new paper. Uh, we got it out in Intelligence. It's a, a meta-analysis of the, the Skyro supposed effect uh, or the uh, Skyro hypothesis. And uh, it's, you know, Brian Pesta was the main author on this one. Um, we're going to go into the study in more details later. So basically it's this one. Okay, so brief background on biometric models. So biometric models are a way of looking at causality uh, in well, various sciences. Uh, instead of using randomized trials or instrumental models or this sort of thing, you can kind of abuse or uh, exploit certain patterns of genetic relatedness or upcoming relatedness um, in, that exist in nature, both in humans and in animals and, and even plants. Um, so... Uh, the, the, the cool thing about this one, uh, this method, is that it allows you to look at entire classes or groups of courses or causes. So you don't really need to uh, specifically measure something. You can kind of just measure this category and you know it's included. Uh, this has uh, has the many benefits. The main two is that, um, is that first, you don't need to worry too much about measurement errors because... As long as your uh, potential cause is in the class that you think, you're gonna have it measured perfectly indirectly using uh, using the design. And second, you avoid the problem of omitted causes or or omitted variables. So uh, let's say you want to look at uh, parenting effects, and you're looking at uh, some different stuff, and some critic comes around after you've done your study and say that hey. You didn't measure uh, parent, uh, parental warmth or some other variable, uh, so you, you omitted it from your model. So what, when you focus instead of all like family effects or all sibling effects, you're already in including whatever it is that critics can come up with afterwards. Um, to do this, you need uh, various family members or like quasi-family members like adopted kids. And um, you also need to make various assumptions that depend on which exact uh, family members you have in your specific case. And some of these assumptions can be quite strong, but they fortunately can be investigated with other methods. So you can, you can build a, um, a nomological network of signs that can support each other of a given study can't test every possible assumption, but then you all would have a different start study that can cover the one you didn't test uh, in that one, in the first one. And so um, this has been done since the 1920s or 1910s or 20s or so when the first adoption studies and, and twin studies were done uh, if you want to exclude the Galton stuff. And these these uh, methods kind of give uh, broadly similar results. Not always the same, um, but sometimes like two different studies will not give the same results merely due to sampling error and measurement differences and so on. Um, the the plot here shows the, the typical, the most common one, which is the, uh, the so-called standard uh, twin design. And... Um, in this design, you use uh, monozygotic twins and uh, dizygotic twins. So these are uh, one egg twins and two egg twins. And the difference between this, uh, so you only need two classes of uh, family uh, members. And so uh, these are both usually in the typical design. They both grow up in uh, together. And so in that sense, they both have the, the common environment, this one in common. That's why the correlation is one, because it's shared. And then uh, the monozygotic twins have twice the genetic relatedness as the as the as the dizygotic twins and that's the a here so a is the additive genetics um it actually gets more complicated if you if you want to look into like dominant genetics and stuff like this but in the typical way it's used in literature they basically just ignore these and say that uh they may exist but we're assuming them to be too small to care about here um so uh, a particular cool way of looking at other designs that can kind of verify the, the common twin model or the standard twin model is the, the study by Kentler et al. 2016. And um, so they used, um, it's a Swedish study, and they used uh, siblings of, of various kinds, full siblings, half siblings, step siblings. Uh, cause, and because you have the Swedish twin register data, it's massive sample size, more than 100,000 uh, even pairs of siblings. Uh, and so you also know, because of registered data, how long they've been living uh, together, so and which parent they were living with, and so on. So you can move, you can put all this in your model, uh, or even like averages if you don't know exactly if there's missing data. So mostly, for instance, half siblings when they have parents in common, they live together with them. It's gonna be it's gonna be the mother most of the time. 
Uh, and so you can use the cases where you have data to figure out the values you need to impute in the cases you don't have the data. Um, the cool thing, uh, the specific thing they're abusing or uh, using in this study is also that uh, siblings uh, have different ages. And so there's like different uh, years between uh, between the siblings and when they're born. So like uh, I have a brother and he's five years younger than me. and uh, But there are some other families where there's only, uh, say, two difference, uh, two years of difference or 10 years difference or even 20 years uh, especially when you look at half siblings, because uh, you can have multiple uh, man has one family and then another and so on. And so this gives rise to different predictions because the, the common environment uh, will be mostly due to stuff they, they share in childhood until they move out, right? So you can you can compute how long siblings have been living together um, using these, these data that the register has because you know when everybody moves. Um, and so in this study, they looked at three different outcomes. So they looked at drug abuse, uh, alcohol use, which is just drug abuse again, uh, but with uh, a specific drug, and they have a criminal behavior. So criminal behavior is like convictions and stuff, which again, because register the data, you have everybody who's who has been convicted in court and so on. So it's it's a highly reliable, but possibly uh, somewhat uh, dichotomous measure because there's some people who do a lot of criminal stuff and they never get caught and so on. Um, so you kind of have measurement error in that way. Um, but it's it's very good in this uh, in this compared to like self-report. The the very nice thing about this study is they also used um, the normal the standard twin study design to compare. So they used the same the same uh, variables and and so on and the same population, which is Sweden, just like a different design. So you can compare these two designs for the same traits at the same time and see if they agree. And um, they, because they have so many sibling types and uh, and parents they can live with and so on, they get a lot of results. And um, but if we are to focus, they get fifty four heritability estimates from these from these sibling studies. And then, if you compare these uh, to the results from the uh, from the twins, you see that um, the ones from the siblings were lower, tied, or higher than the ones from twins in. 26, 1, and 27 comparisons, which is to say that they seem to be randomly distributed uh, across being higher and lower for heritability, which is to say that the heritability estimates of this twin model are consistent or yeah, consistent or unbiased with the ones from, uh, from the twin studies. And this wasn't the case for shared environment estimates, which were um, actually found to be lower than those in twin studies, which suggests that twin studies are underestimating them. And... Um, for those who've been reading about twin studies, one common problem of of them that usually is not taken into account is a sort of mating. And so what it means is that parents that have uh, parents they uh, mate with people um, that have different uh, that have similar traits to themselves, and this results in a bias and up uh, a negative bias uh, for heritability and upwards bias of shared environment in in the standard twin design. Uh, it's it's easy enough to adjust adjust for if you want to. Uh, but most studies seemingly don't want to or don't care, and I don't know why they don't do it. Um, so the Sky Row hypothesis is um, it's named after Sky and Row, and Sky and Row are these two people here. Uh, so uh, Sandra Sky, she used to be uh, a researcher, and she's still alive, as far as I can tell. She's eighty-two or something. Um, she's a long-term friendly critic of uh, Jensen and these other like kind of nice hereditarians. Um, and she was mainly active, I think, from the 1970s to 2000 or so, um, at, at which point she got pensioned and then like moved to Hawaii and became like a farmer or something. It seems that she gave up. Um, David Rowe uh, was a good guy, behavioral geneticist, and um, he unfortunately died kind of early in like his 50s or so um, from like cancer. And so um, that's unfortunate. Um, the the idea of the Scar Rowe uh, hypothesis, which I've abbreviated to SRH here, is that um, environment quality moderates heritability such that uh, when you live in a better environment, uh, the genetic effect is, is larger, at least relatively speaking. And um, so what this, uh, the typical way is that they're kind of thinking at either environment as a, like a threshold uh, like, or it has like diminishing returns. So it's continuously, um, so this, this uh, we're going to go into it more, but this, this, uh, this has impl implications for the, uh, the race difference in intelligence debate because uh, there's a well-known difference in the, the, the typical environments. People focus on parental uh, 
parental income, wealth, uh, kind of treatment the parents do, where they live, pollution, blah, 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 all these things. Uh, they basically differ between um, blacks and whites in the U.S. and usually also other countries in a way that favors the, uh, the, the, the group with the higher mean IQ or the higher intelligence level. And, and so in this way, um, and so uh, there's actually two Sky Roja purposes, and the main one is, is for uh, socioeconomic status, and the then implied one is, is for race. And uh, the one in our paper we looked at is uh, the one for race, the implied one, which uh, has not been meta-analyzed previously. Um, well, there was a, one previous one, but not a like a systematic review. So uh, one way to visualize uh, is to do it like this. And so Jensen uh, 1968 provides a, a very neat plot uh, that we have on the right here. And you should probably read the paper because it's actually quite good. And it's not the 1969, that's the favorite, uh, the famous paper. It's the 1968 paper, uh, which came before and, and didn't cause a, a big stir. Actually, that's the one that that resulted in Jensen being invited to write his now famous article and that put into all this trouble. And so what I just explained is you can see here. In this case, uh, this is the kind of environmental uh, bonus you get uh, the y-axis is the environmental effect, uh, and the the environment quality is is on the the x-axis here. And so the idea is that uh, if you're extremely deprived, you basically kind of grow up in a closet, you get no food, or like no one talks to you, you this this sort of thing. Uh, you are gonna have uh, a large negative environmental effect on your actual IQ and also the tested uh, IQ scores and probably other traits. And, but as environment gets better and better, there's um, diminishing returns or a threshold in this case where that once you get more enrichment, uh, a better environment after this stage, it no longer re results in any higher trade score. So it no longer improves anything. Um, it's There's kind of level as a threshold. As soon as you get to that level, basically any improvement after that doesn't do anything. Um, and it's in this plot, we can see that the, uh, the Negro, uh, as they, which what they used to call blacks, uh, population is down here, which is still in the, in the, in the range where this, uh, environment differences has an effect, while almost all the white people over here are, are no longer in the region where environmental effects appear. And so what this is implies is that, um, it implies that the heritability should be lower in blacks and, and shared environment, uh, if this is the environment that's relevant, should be should be higher. Or it, it could be unique environment, which uh, is weird. So we're going to focus on shared environment. Um, it also has uh, the uh, it also has a different implication, which is to say that the due to the historical improvement over time, which is like the Flynn effects, everybody get richer over time, historic, uh, technology gets better, diseases we eradicate, and so on. Uh, Actually, uh, heritability should grow closer or become exactly equalized over over time, depending on whether you're assuming a threshold model or a uh, diminishing returns model. If it's the diminishing returns, the heritabilities never become exactly equal, but they become arbitrarily close uh, to being equal. And if it's a threshold, they become exactly equal after everybody is above whatever threshold it is. Um, so uh, another way to look at the the importance of heritability differences then is to uh, is to look at ethics and uh, we quote in our paper Pesta et al. 220 even though it came out in 219 academics they work in the future sometimes um, there is a lot of people who over years have been arguing that uh, heritability is an index of fair fairness in some sense or social justice or environmental equality and and so on there's a bunch of there's a bunch of quotes uh, shown here and um, so this this um, the reasoning they if people give for this um, counterintuitive um, counterintuitive implication is that uh, the heritability is highest when family effect is minimized, and so when you put the the family effects eventually to zero, uh, which is to say that growing up in a rich family, say or a highly educated family, has no causal effect in itself aside from genetics on how well you do in say school or uh, how much criminal you become later. Uh, that that's more fair than than if parents have some kind of effects, um, which is kind of a, a funny thing when you first discover this fact. Um, it has the implicit pre premise, of course, that uh, family effects are unfair and genetic ones are at least more fair, um, which is, I guess you could sort of uh, support. 
Uh, or you could just go and say everything is unfair all the time, but then it's not very useful to debate fairness uh, because then there's nothing to debate, right? Um, which also, uh, but if you accept that uh, genetic ones are more fair, that kind of seems to imply that you should actually identify with your genome and therefore that monozygotic twins or uh, clones would actually be uh, the same person, which uh, could be a fun uh, thing. It also seems to imply that uh, at least all is equal. If you can establish that uh, heritabilities are equal by race, then it seems that society is equally fair, at least with regards to family environment uh, by race. And that that's basically the one of the exact opposites of the cultural narratives we're being told, like black uh, and so on. People, they suffer from basically everything you can imagine, and that's unfair and so on. Um, a funny, funny implication of this one, I, I haven't seen it before, is that uh, the, the fairest society is one where heritability is 100%, uh, because, of course, um, if, if unfairness is uh, lower heritability, then higher heritability is more fair. And so, so actually, it is possible to increase the heritability aside from removing uh, family effects uh, or like distributing kids to be reared uh, in, in common, as they used to do in the kibbutz in Israel. Uh, we could do that is if we took certain segments of the population and we gave some of them biotech eugenics like IVF, uh, embryo selection, this sort of thing. And other people, they kind of were left to their own. And, and so this would happen automatically because if you just make the technology available, then some people will use it and, and others won't. And so there's selective use on it. And some people will use it, but not for intelligence, say, and others will use it for, I don't know, musical talent or being attractive or very tall or good at basketball or something. Uh, so there would definitely be more genetic variants in a lot of different traits in the population. And because of the way uh, heritabilities work, uh, this results in higher heritability uh, in society, because the heritability is the is the ratio, uh, the genetic variance divided by the total variance. I wrote it down. I wrote it incorrectly down there. Uh, and so, genetic variance increases uh, when you use this selective eugenics thing. It's just kind of a fun philosophical point. Um, the second reason uh, that heritability differences uh, by race then matter is that there is in fact uh, formal relationships, or there are in fact formal relationships between uh, within group heritability and between group heritability. Uh, if you read around, you can see that it's often denied that um, within group heritability doesn't imply a, a between group heritability. That, that is true uh, by itself. It doesn't imply it in a, in a strict logical deductive sense, but it does have certain implications mathematically. Um, specifically, if you assume a null genetics model, which is to say you assume uh, an environmentalist extremist model or a blank slate this model, and then that the ca the course uh, the cause of the IQ gap between two groups is due to varying causes. So these are causes that are not the same; they differ from person to person. Then you get the implication that if the cause is more important among blacks, then the heritability must be lower because you have this extra uh, env environmental effect, and that would be. The, for instance, the family environment thing that Scar Rowe looked, is looking at. Um, if, if, um, so if it, that's, if it just is more important um, among blacks. Um, also, if you, uh, if the cause is shared, so it's something that uh, exists, exists uh, for both race, races, let's say per, how many books you have in your home, right? It, it differs both among uh, white families and say black families and Asian families and Indian families and so on. Then you can compute uh, how large the gap must be in this uh, in this proposed environmental cause for it to possibly explain the one standard deviation gap, and it's uh, you get the it you can compute it like this. Um, and so this is the table from from Jensen's uh, book, and uh, what we have uh, here is the, the blank slate null genetics model, and the this is the within group heritability, uh, which is assumed to be the same. And so what we really see is that if the within group heritability is say 70%, the one that Jensen has kind of starred, um, that's, that was his assumption in his calculation, then um, the, and you assume no genetic causation of between group differences, then whatever environmental cause you're saying, it must be about two standard deviations large. So the difference between, uh, between the populations, they must differ this much for the mathematics to work out. And so two standard deviations is a lot. Um, that would mean that there's almost no overlap in these in these environments. And um, if you are to in fact look up uh, 
how much uh, blacks and white differ in in shared environment things like like um, like parental social status. You'll find that they differ about half to 0.7 or so standard deviation. And so if this has to be two, you have a problem, right? It's it's only a third of or a fourth of the size it's supposed to be. Uh, and so the math doesn't work out, and your model just just fails. Um, but but this uh, this calculation has has certain assumptions. Um, the main one, uh, well, I'm fucked up there. Uh, the main one is that um, within group heritability is, is the same by race, um, and also that um, all the um, all the environment, all the non-genetic effects are things that kind of can contribute to the group difference. So that's what Jensen did. So um, in this table. And the, the second thing uh, is actually quite problematic because it's it's well known that uh, most of the the non-genetic variants, uh, when you look at IQ in adulthood, is what seems to be random. It's it's the non-shared environment, and it doesn't really seem to relate with much of anything else. Uh, so it's generally per um, perceived to be mostly random chance or somatic mutations, which is to say. Uh, mutations that happen in your body in different parts or so after conception, right? So somatic mutations are not set by, shared by identical twins because they happen after uh, the split of the uh, of the fetus in this early stage. Um, however, if if uh, white and black heritabilities are not the same, uh, then it's possible that uh, the real life observed environmental gaps might be large enough to account for the IQ gap. And so it really depends on how large the difference is uh, in this and what kind of uh, what kind of other variants is is responsible for IQ variation among blacks? Um, as far as I know, no one has actually produced any tables that vary systematically these assumptions or even like graphically. So um, that's kind of a problem that we should uh, do soon. However, so from a null genetic position, it's it's important to try to establish that the heritabilities are not the same, and that's why. That's why uh, Flynn was arguing this point in 1980, and that's the reason for SCAR's research program that she started in, in 1971. And you should you should totally read that paper because it's actually quite nice. Um, so, also this is kind of what what Eric Turkheimer has been working on. And uh, if you encountered the SCAR row, everybody well eventually refers to you to to this paper, Turkheimer. Et al. 2003, and what it is, it's a kind of small twin study where it has like massive number of citations, 1500 almost on Google Scholar, uh, and extreme results. And so, if you're thinking, yeah, publication crisis stuff, then you you got to be skeptical, right? And the extreme results is that um, among the the top uh, SES in his uh, in his study, uh, even for kids, I think this one is for kids. Um, like heritability uh, is almost it's like 80 even almost 90 percent for people in, in, a, in a in the top deci or the top uh, environment in the study and it's about zero for people in the lowest in, in again in the study so it seems to show and it's often cited to show there's a massive difference in heritability by by social status um, fortunately someone did a replication and of course as I was saying the replication crisis, uh, tells us to be super skeptical about highly cited tiny studies and um, because they're usually outliers, right? And people are engaging in, in selective citation where they just keep citing the one study that agrees with them, which is like a tiny one, and then they ignore like the 10 other studies that don't agree too much with them or have like mass, even no, no effect size or just quite small effect sizes. Uh, and this, this is definitely the case for, for, the, for, this, case, uh, for this phenomenon. And so we can look at the, the meta-analysis by Truger, Drop and Bates uh, from 2016. And so they, they looked at the one, not for race, but the sky row for uh, socioeconomic status. And they, it's a worldwide meta-analysis. So they looked at results uh, from like other European descent countries, England, Netherlands, Germany, Sweden, Austria. These are the red dots. And the, the black ones are United States. And so it kind of plays into the, the kind of mytho, um, mythotology, uh, yeah, mythology that um, that uh, that exists among that exists among many um, um, academics in the U.S., which is like Europe is like one thing, and then like U.S. history of slavery, blah blah blah. It's totally different. It's like qualitative difference, something like this. So they want to split the samples. So they did this massive meta analysis, and they found um, 
no uh, no overall effect. Actually, the the main uh, effects which don't show in this plot is actually uh, about here. So it's it's almost zero, and uh, it's not even significant, even though with this massive sample size. And so, but if you are to do you split the data into this like US versus not US, you get this split, and you can see that the effect size is positive over here, and it's actually negative a little bit, but I think non significantly for the non US. And the Turkheimer study that's often cited is over here. So it's it's the by far the largest effect size of the entire literature here. Um, and it's quite small because you can see the, this is the standard error. So studies further up have uh, less statistical power to spot uh, the difference. Um, so basically Turkheimer did not really replicate in that sense that um, that this study or this division between studies is, uh, is post hoc. Um, I don't know exactly what they were doing when they did this, but it's not pre-registered and you don't really know whether they intended to do this moderate analysis or not. And, um, but the kind of the paper, if you read the title, kind of pretends that, oh yeah, there's massive international differences uh, based on this, uh, this division in the data, it's probably not real. Um, a different problem is the, uh, the possibility of publication bias. Um, and so, I looked at the just the scatter plots of two in or kind of the funnel plot, but the lazy man's funnel plot, and um, it looks like this. So I downloaded the data, which the authors were nice to share on OSF. And if you look at the entire sample of studies, you see that um, there is a negative correlation between the effect size. The effect size is the uh, the A here uh, on the y-axis and the the sample size on the uh, x-axis. And what it really shows is that the larger studies tend to find smaller effects. Um, so that makes us skeptical, but there's only 17 studies and the correlation is, is not significant here. Um, however, if you look at within the, within the US studies only over here, there's only eight studies, but now we see the correlation is, uh, is quite larger. It's still not significant uh, because you can see the, the confidence walls, they overlap here. Uh, but you can, you, it's definitely suggestive of publication bias. And here we have the Turk Hammer study up here, which is the largest, uh, effect size, of course. Um, so you definitely have reason to be skeptical, right? Post hoc oversighted study, like look at one subset of the data and it's significant there. I mean, uh, that's a little dubious. So fortunately, someone, Figlio et al, did a massive kind of replication study. And so what they did is that they had uh, also registered data, which is cool, um, confidential population level administrative data uh, where they basically have kids and where they go to school and what kind of scores they got and like some teachers and stuff like this. And uh, they also have parental stuff because you can like link the kids names to uh, other names you get in the census or something like this. And you can kind of get the parental income or education level or something like that. Uh, something you can do use to use, uh, you can use to get uh, socioeconomic status. Um, so they did, um, one problem with this study is that they didn't have twin psychoticity. So they didn't have uh, monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. They just had uh, sexes, which they can get from school registers, or you can get it from the name with very high precision. And so what you have is that when you have opposite sex siblings that are born in the same day, these must be opposite sex uh, twins, dizygotic twins. And when you have same sex twins, so born in the same day, uh, you don't know whether it's monozygotic or dizygotic, but you know that it's actually roughly 50-50 because of the, you know the distribution of uh, the relative numbers of monozygotic and dizygotic twins. And uh, of course, um, for dizygotic twins, they, they're basically independent siblings that kind of grew up in the same womb. And so they, they have like 50% chance of being male or female, right? Anyway, so what you can do, you can still figure out the heritability if you just use the average relatedness. And um, so they they did use this to do uh, an estimate of the uh, sky row for uh, socioeconomic status, which is the one showed in this column. Um, and this, these are the certainties. And so that you can see the sample size are massive because it's uh, population register data. And um, all these values, the effect sizes are, are negative. And so this actually means that they found exactly the opposite results of, of this, where you can see the result, the effect they want to claim over here is positive, right? They want to claim their meta analysis an effect of 0.08 or something like that. Whereas in reality, they get an effect size of, mm, yeah, roughly negative, roughly just multiplied by minus one, right? 
And, and you can see that even with this uh, sample size, it's actually non-significant, some of the estimates. These two uh, estimates are non-significant and these are like barely or somewhat significant. Uh, and these are the different grades and, and so on. And so this is a massive replication study that basically blows the scar row out of the water. Uh, or it, maybe it's negative, right? which is, would be weird. Um, there are actually some other studies that find negative in like last large data as well, but I'm I'm kind of skeptical. Maybe it's some, maybe it has something to do with the use of of this twin assumption model, um, though it has been used in other studies. And in fact, this uh, model where you don't know the Sagosit, the Sagosit here twins, it actually was also used in the original SCAR study from seventy one. Um, in the published paper, though, they didn't report the results for race, uh, but actually, uh, we requested them. Uh, it's computed and they send it to us and there's no uh, there's no significant effect for race in the study except that as you'll see Hispanics are higher in heritability but African and whites are equal which is you know what you expect and so finally we get to our study which is uh, the PESTA et al study and so we had data from 16 studies or samples and with massive sample size be mainly because we use this FICLO, FIC FICLIO at our study in ours, um, we mostly focus on whites, blacks, and Hispanics, and that's just mainly because there are some samples with Asians and multiracial and others or something, but they're very tiny, and so or there's very few of them, and the ones that are tiny, so meta-analyzing them is just a bunch of noise. So it's uh, I would only really look at the first the first three up here, and what we see is that if you look across all studies, um, then the heritability for white kids uh, is, I think these are mostly kids, uh, it's about 58% and the for blacks it's 60, so actually it's very slightly smaller for blacks. The shared environment is about 20% or 15% here, so actually this goes in the wrong direction of Sky Row as well. And uh, for here over here, um, these are about the same, uh, which is not entirely consistent because they don't sum to exactly one, but it's, it's close enough. Um, Hispanics has fewer studies and I think also smaller studies, uh, mainly because there didn't used to be many Hispanics in the US and so you can only kind of use recent data. Uh, they actually have slightly higher heritability, um, but I'm not really sure this should be taken that much because there's only seven samples, so it can be like they have different ages or something. Uh, you can't really say with these. Uh, a different way of looking at it is that you can look at, instead of meta-analyzing results across samples, which means that uh, when you find a difference in heritability, it could be because uh, this study had, uh, the first study had like a mean age of 15 years and the, the second study had a mean age of 30 uh, or something else about the study. Like they measured it differently. One study had a bad IQ test, the other one a really good one because when you have a bad one, all the values would be uh, pushed towards uh, zero except for the unshared environment. Um, so what a different one, you can a different method is you look at the studies that reported uh, results, but for um, at least two groups. And then within that study, you compute the difference in the heritability, shared environment, and the unshared environment, and then you meta-analyze these, these delta values. And so when you do it this way, you have fewer samples because not all samples report more than one. However, uh, they're definitely, they're kind of guaranteed to be matched at least within whatever it is that is constant within studies. But but if you do this, you more or less get the same results, which is that um, you get the, the heritability is, is more or less the same uh, within. And um, so again, like the Hispanics, um, they somehow have higher uh, heritability of 73 here, um, but it's probably uh, a sample size problem or a study difference or something. So, there is also previously before this meta-analysis was done, there's uh, Jensen, of course, didn't just assume this, you know, without any kind of reason. He had indirect reasons to do this. And I found this, uh, this amusing example of, uh, of Jensen uh, from some book, uh, from his book. And um, when he, he was a, a school psychologist kind of before he was uh, being vilified. And so he worked with the Californian school system in the 60s and 70s, and he was uh, advising people who came to giving questions. In one case here, there was uh, one school where they had a gifted program. And so what happened is the gifted programs for the really smart kids, so it's mostly gonna be the higher IQ races who have their kids in these. 
and and so uh, they basically they're not they're not sufficiently diverse by the usual uh, quotas, and so eventually some someone will complain, and then someone will get it as as their job to try to increase the the diversity in these programs, uh, which is to say we need more blacks and Hispanics and uh, Amerindians and whatever. Um, and so one method uh, that the school have noticed is that when you have one academically gifted kid, uh, then siblings are often, in white kids, they're often academically gifted as well. I think it says about uh, a third chance or so. Uh, and so they were like, hmm, maybe we should just test the, just going to go test the kids, the, the siblings of all the black kids in the program and not the white kids, uh, assuming otherwise it wouldn't work, right? And to see if we can get them smart one. But they found that when you do this in, in white kids, it works reasonably well a third of the time or so. You get lucky and the, the sibling will also be above whatever threshold it is they have for uh, for academically gifted. But when you do it in blacks, it usually doesn't work because the siblings are not as smart. And uh, if you're watching this, you probably know why that's the case. It's called regression towards the mean. And so even though the correlation among siblings uh, is about the same for blacks and whites, uh, because of the population means that they regress further towards their own mean because they go about halfway down. Um, and so it's it's an indirect measure of the uh, of the sibling correlation. And there's a bunch of other studies that have correlations of siblings for blacks and whites. And uh, we also replicated it recently in the who, who or who, I don't, I don't know how to say it, it's Chinese, uh, using the NLSY, uh, I think it's the 97 one, and in like 700 white and 300 black full sibling pairs and and what when you do this sibling study only instead of the twin study you're only looking at the um the shared effect versus the unshared effect so the shared effect is just whatever siblings have in common we can see that this is about the same size for for blacks and whites um and so then they also have the same stuff not in common uh, so they have the same ratio of shared effects and non-shared effects and and this this actually can sort of rule out uh, large differences or some versions of Scarrow, depending on if you think that Scarrow results from like family environment stuff, then black kids should have higher sibling correlations than white kids, and they don't have that. Uh, so it's prima facie evidence for or against the Scarrow um, for race and socioeconomics. So. Supposing we've established that there is no scar row, or maybe there is, but it's at least it's definitely small if it is there for whites and blacks. And if it's for Hispanics, then if anything, then apparently it's in the wrong direction. Um, but I wouldn't really trust that result. Um, there's no scar row. You can still sort of sec um, rescue the uh, the non-genetic or the null-genetic meta model, so to say. It's kind of a uh, it's kind of a meta parameter or a hyperparameter in Bayesian talk. Um, so one thing you could do is that you can claim that there is a an unvarying cause, right? So there's some kind of cause that uh, has uh, cause that, that causes lower IQs among blacks, but it has no variation within blacks, um, and therefore it does not uh, result in any variance. Um, so if it doesn't vary between different black people, then of course it will not have any variance. Which all and so therefore it doesn't affect the scar row calculations and wouldn't be seen in in these studies we just had. Which is to say, it's a kind of a god of the gaps argument. We haven't ruled it out yet, at least in this method. Um, however, if it, you want to say it's an unvarying cause, you also have problems that because also for the same reason as it's good, it's bad. If it's if it if it doesn't vary among blacks, it can't be related to anything that varies among blacks, right? Because things that ha have no variance can't be related to anything else, right? It's you divide by zero. Uh, and so it can't be it can't be something that's related to skin color, hair type, neighborhood income, family education. It can't be related to anything in the real world, so to say, because no one has uh, really discovered anything that doesn't vary much in the real world. And so you can't really say the silver bullet is, it's just because they all experience racism because everybody knows um, even granting like systemic or institutional racism stuff, some people would be more exposed to it than others. Like some blacks live in neighborhoods with only other blacks and therefore it's kind of difficult to be exposed to the whites uh, if they're evil and have evil eyes that cause lower IQs. And some blacks live in only nice neighborhoods. Some blacks live in neighborhoods with lots of nice wise people, very woke, blah, blah, blah. Others live in neighborhoods full of Republicans in, in like the deep south, stuff like that. 
So basically, whatever racism hypothesis you're claiming, it will definitely vary between blacks, and then it can't be an X-factor. Uh, it must be a varying course, and then you're back to the same problem you had before, is that, okay, your theory implies there's a scar row, and we don't see one. Why? Um, and so, so basically, no one really knows of any plausible candidates for this um, for this X-factor. And um, a different problem with these, uh, in this, even if you were to assume them, they would have to have unusual properties is that uh, all these kind of like the difference between blacks and whites is is known to be on, on the g factor and usually environmental um, correlates or causes uh, of iq scores they don't they're not on the g factor and so kind of by implicate um by probability not a certain conclusion but you can infer that it's unlikely uh, that an environmental cause is the cause of the between group gap because the psychometrics are incorrect, right? Um, and furthermore, one thing that hasn't been noticed much, but uh, actually, if you can est establish strict measurement invariance uh, in a measurement uh, study, then X factors are impossible. They're ruled out in the same way that Levantin's like seed analogy. And these are the kind of un uh, causes that are only relevant in one group, not the other one. They're all ruled out uh, if if you if you can accept strict measurement invariance, and so we've actually been studying uh, st strict measurement invariance in a bunch of studies, and it seems to it seems to mostly hold uh, in in the studies, and so x factors are just ruled out, and the variant factors they they can't work because there's no scar row. Uh, then uh, what do you, what do you have left? Uh, it's kind of weird. Um, ba the the kind of takeaway is that there is a lack of quantitative modeling to examine potential non-genetic models uh, that could fit the data. And so there isn't like a go-to paper can say that, oh, here's someone who tried varying every possible assumption or every plausible assumption that uh, null genetic meta models can do. Uh, you can accept, like, let's say that the gap is cost uh, one third by X factors, which are like 10 different of them. And you can say it's varying causes and the causes are, you can try to make them uncorrelated because that makes things better for you. Um, no one has really kind of done such a a, a, a nice quantitative uh, method study. So it's kind of, it's unknown exactly how kind of a mixed model of causes would work out. Uh, but definitely these like symbol, symbol models are, are ruled out by, by some of these data. Uh, a kind of amusing, funny example is the Light and Smith 69 um, attempt that was then like uh, debunked in not, not nice very terms or not very nice terms by, by Bill Shockley. Um, and uh, this time I put all the references in the text uh, in kind of a APA, APA format, this kind of format. You just go to the end, you can look up the thing. I've all linked them here. And uh, of course, you just go to Sci-Hub or whatever if you, if you need the paper. Um, so that's it for today and uh, enjoy. What is fucking wrong with you? You are a horrible human being. You are a horrible human being. Liberal tolerance at hand.